Well, there would have been a video there, but you know, we're going to make do. We're going to make it work. Okay. Just imagine the bumper. Go back and watch it online. It's the same thing you saw last week. Hey, uh, my name is Joel Adorno. I'm the lead pastor. And uh, we said it on the video. I want to say it again. We need a ton of these and these. Matter of fact, you're on your phones anyway. You think I can't see you? Uh, I can see your laps from up here, the way the room is shaped. You're on your phone anyway, so go online at Target or Walmart, whatever you prefer on their app, and order a bunch of these and a bunch of these for pickup. And about the time you're probably either finished with the service or finished with lunch, you can pick these up and drop these off. Uh, we're about 40-something percent of the way there on both of these items. We figure we need thousands upon thousands. We're recycling the eggs this year, so the children will hunt for the eggs, turn in the empty eggs, and then we give them like a little grab bag of candy that they'll take with them. That's how we're able to make sure that the children that need allergy-sensitive candy can get it without having to deal with, you know, melting chocolate out in the yard. So that's why we need so much. That's why we're also, we're also going to save these year to year, and we want to have a few extra in case we do lose them. It's going to be incredible. So hopefully you place those online orders, and uh, it'll be ready, I'm sure, by the time you're done with lunch. Let me just hide that. Is that hidden? Uh, it may not be too visible on camera. Down lower, you think? Okay. Sorry, I'm getting all the hand signals in the back. Let me just take this over here, y'all. Hang on. You see, when you got to deal with online streaming and you got to deal with recorded messages, you have to deal with what it looks like behind you. So people online aren't going, why is there a bag of candy back there? If you are joining us online, we are so glad that you're there. And we have a blast here. And we're so thankful to be able to bring this to you wherever you find yourself. Maybe you're watching because you're homesick today. Maybe you're watching because you're checking us out. We know that there are folks who will check us out online before they ever join us in person. And that's cool. That's great. And we'll be so excited when you are able to join us here and get to see that we really are uh, this relaxed sometimes with things. But we just have a great time because we believe that being part of Jesus' family is a celebration of life. And so we love to live that way. So we're glad you're there, and we can't wait till you are here. So I want to start the message today talking about secret sin. You know, secret sin, those are those things that we do that we think it doesn't affect anybody else. That, I mean, we, we do it, and we think, okay, it, it only affects me. And then after a while, we actually think it doesn't affect me. You know, we have these sins, sins that we participate in that we go, well, you know, I'm not going to let other people see this because they think it's bad, but then I don't think it's all that bad because, I mean, if I thought it was all that bad, I probably wouldn't do it. Well, one of those like acceptable secret sins we as Christians have is, is kind of faking the part a little bit, faking the part of a Christian, acting like we're a Christian and really not experiencing the power of that. We can get really good at going through the motions but then we sometimes forget about everything else that Jesus has called us to be. We forget about the behavior part, and we just simply kind of, well, we, we fake it. And the problem is, as we've talked about through this series, is that we can fake things to the point that we fool ourselves, and we begin to think that we're actually doing the right thing when we're not. And I fear that what a pastor of long ago said, he stood in front of his congregation of thousands of people, and his opening statement to his sermon was, I fear that upwards to 70% of you are going to hell if you were to die right now. And he said that because the reality is a lot of people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. They're going to know all the right stuff, but they're not going to actually have anything in their souls. It's just actions. So roughly once a year, we do a series like this. This year it's called Bad Religion. One year it was called burned. I mean, it's just this idea that we have to sometimes stop and go back to what does it mean to be a, a believer in Jesus, a disciple of Jesus? What does that mean to walk that out, flaws and all? And today we're really hitting that one when we talk about faking it because we, we, we're going to really talk about the fact that our flaws, what we're, the very thing we're trying to cover up is exactly the stuff we need to bring to Jesus anyway. We're in Luke chapter 11 for that conversation. Luke 11, starting at verse 37 and going all the way down through verse 3 of chapter 12. And in the Pew Bible there in front of you, it's page 710. So it's 710 in this Pew Bible. And if you do not have a print Bible of your own, please keep this as a gift. We love nothing more than to come through during the week and restock these because it means you've taken them. Or it means maybe you've taken one because you're going to give it to a friend or a neighbor. By all means, walk out of here with a stack of them. I mean, that would be incredible. But whether you're taking it to borrow or taking it to keep, page 710 there, words are also on the screen. You can look it up, and this is what I would prefer you to do. Look it up in your own Bible, print or electronic. I don't care which. Just get into the Bible so it gets into you. Ooh, some of you remember from last week. Okay. Whew. 
Good. Now, let's dig into this, starting here at the first two verses of this text. Luke chapter 11, verses 37 and 38. It says, When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not wash before, first wash before the meal. Now let's deal with the first things first. This washing had nothing to do with hygiene. Okay, this wasn't like, you know, Jesus washing his hands with soap and water before he's having a meal. This was a ceremonial thing that the Pharisees had decided people needed to do in order to symbolically wash away the defilement from being in a sinful world. It was just something they made up. It wasn't in the Bible, they just made that part up. Now let's go back another step. Who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees were a social, religious, political party that existed at the time of Jesus. They were, they were some of the leaders of the Jewish people under Roman occupation, but they were like the theological conservatives of their day. They were us. They believed that the Scriptures were God's Word and that they should obey every word of it. We, we believe that too. They believed that, that you should live a holy life. We believe that too. They believed that, that the only way to please God was to live in such a way as to live a life that was separate and to show that there was something different about us. Well, to a large degree, we believe that too. Where the Pharisees had gotten sideways is a few hundred years prior, they had begun to add things to the Bible. Whereas God would say, don't work on the Sabbath, they said, well, you can only walk so many steps on the Sabbath and then it's work. Or they would say, well, you can maybe wash the dish, but you can't dry it. I mean, they, they would just create all these extra laws that people had to obey. And it just became so burdensome and cumbersome on people because they become so obsessed with outward purity. So that's why the Pharisee that invited Jesus into his home is sitting there, and that's why he was shocked. He was offended even that Jesus would not participate in this ceremonial washing of his hands to remove the defilement from messing around in a sinful world. And so then Jesus looks at him, and he says this. I, I laugh because it's just like this guy is shocked and offended. And here's Jesus' response, verses 39 through 44. The Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people. Did not the one who make the outside make the inside also? But now, as far as what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves which people walk over without knowing it. Now, woe is a, a symbol, a word meaning judgment. It's a, it's a way to throw judgment on them. It's also an expression of sorrow and grief. Jesus isn't happy about saying these things, but it is the truth. This is what they had made of Judaism. This was what they had created. This was the system they had so established that Jesus, the Son of God, is going, You've gotten some of it right, perfectly right maybe, but you've, you've missed the other part of it. You've missed all of the half of this. You've missed the behavioral part that actually changes how you think and how you feel and thus will change how you act. You see, it's not just that we should be focused on the outward appearances. That's what they did. Their outward appearance was, was seeking perfection and it impressed people. But Jesus was not impressed. Now, it wasn't just this Pharisee and a few people sitting around. There were some others there, too. Verses 45 through 54, one of the experts in the law answered him. Now, these experts in the law would be like, like biblical attorneys. These were experts in the Old Testament law. These were like the combination of attorney and Ph.D. of theology. These were the big heads, you know. These were the walking brains on a stick that helped the Pharisees figure stuff out. And boy, they sometimes got made things really, really complicated. So one of these experts in the law answered Jesus and said, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, And you, experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. 
Woe to you because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you built their tombs. Because of this, God in His wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill, and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered. And you have hindered those who were entering. When Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. See, these biblical attorneys, these experts in the law, they had turned a beautiful study of theology in the Old Testament into intellectual elitism to where only the most educated would apply. Over time, it got to the point that the average person felt that the Scriptures were inaccessible to them because only the experts could have understood it anyway. And they just completely relied on what was was told to them and and, and, and were explained to them. And it didn't matter how left or right or wonky it might have been, they simply believed them because those were the experts. And the common person felt so distant from the God who said, I have called you by name and I have formed you in your mother's womb. They felt very distant. And they themselves didn't even have this this key to knowledge. Proverbs tells us that the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. And that they didn't even understand really who the Lord was. It was just all academic understanding. It was entirely cerebral for them. And Jesus says, not only that, you're keeping people away who would possibly understand because you've made it so impossible to get this. You've made it so impossible to actually understand. People were impressed with these experts in the law and their mental capabilities, but Jesus was not impressed. So then verses 1 through 3 of chapter 12. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that would not be disclosed or hidden that would not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. In other words, in time, their sin would be exposed. In time, their sin would tell on them who they were were going to come out, and the Lord would make sure that the people would see what they really were. But the danger of bad religion is that we can take something that is so beautiful, something that is so profound, something that is so mysterious, and we can replace it with rules and regulations and do's and don'ts and remove it of all the power that it actually has. Or in other words, we can take the mystery right out of it and leave something cold. And that doesn't demand change from us. It just demands IQ. Bad religion takes the good news of Jesus and makes it impossible to obtain. Bad religion takes the beautiful complexities of the Word of God, which is intricately nuanced and amazingly tied together and profoundly deep, and turns it into something that's a rule book, completely emptied of the incredible love of God and the amazing grace of God through Jesus. Bad religion takes sacrifice and replaces it with excuses because I don't want to have to actually do anything, so I just forget that sacrifice thing. I'll just do the easy part, whatever that easy part is. Now, I'm fully aware that the people Jesus were talking to in his day are people like me, the teachers, the people that have some skill and some training. And I think about this passage I'm telling you, this whole series, every message has been directed towards me as anyone else, because I'm very aware that as I stand up here, I have two choices every single Sunday. I can impress you with how much I know. I've got a doctorate in this stuff. I know a few things. I just, come on. I didn't pass all the tests for nothing. I can impress you with all that, and you can go, wow, our pastor is so smart. 
he can speak all these different languages? Wow. Or I can try to make it to where I take what is so complex and, and bring it down to you in such a way that you walk out saying, wow, what a great Savior. What a great Master Jesus is. What, what a great King worth following. And I have a choice every single Sunday which one I'm going to do. Honestly, it'd be a whole lot easier to impress you. That takes a lot less work. And I don't, I don't say that to insult you. I say that because when you're watching me, you're watching me do my job. You're watching me do what is best. It'd be like me going to wherever you work and watching you work. You'd blow me away. I'd be like, how do you how do, you do that? That's amazing. And you'd be like, oh, it's my job. I, I know how to do this because it's my job. I'm skilled at this. I'm trained at this. I'm gifted at this. But I would, I would be so impressed. You see what I'm saying? So it'd be easier for me to stand up and just impress you. But Jesus is saying, whoa, to those who make it so difficult that people can never see the beauty of Jesus through all of this. Because we can feed that same animal too. We can become those Pharisees. We can become those biblical attorneys. We can become those experts in the law that make it so complicated and make Jesus so repulsive to people that they're like, I'll take my chances with the world because I can't do that. I can't be perfect enough. I, I can't be good. I can't know all that you know. And then, I mean, I just want, when I'm talking to people, I would try my best to, to not tell them what I do. Because the last thing I want to do is to make them go, oh, I could never do what you do. That's not what I'm talking about. You see, it's not, it's, not that, 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 it's not that we have to be perfect to come to Jesus. That's the opposite. Because Jesus isn't looking for our perfection. That's what the Pharisees were trying to be. That's what the experts in the law were trying to be. It's what Jesus kept trying to scream at us. You can't be. And that's the point. But what makes our Lord Jesus so magnetic to people? Get this. The grace of Jesus isn't magnetic because of our perfection, but our imperfection. It's one of the greatest paradoxes of Christianity. It's not being perfect that's going to make people go, what do you have? I want to have that. I want to be, man, what's that? Because they know we're faking it. Because nobody's perfect. If you think you are, get on 99 for 10 minutes. Maybe even let, get from here to 99 and see if you're still perfect when you get there. <laughs> some, days, some days I wake up, I'm like, you know, I'm like okay, Lord, you know, so far I, I, I've not sinned. I've not had a bad thought. I've not you know, cursed anybody. Lord, I'm good, but I've got to put my feet on the ground and get out of bed, and I'm going to need your help from here on. I mean, that, it, we're not perfect. But that's not what makes Jesus magnetic. He's perfect. We're not what makes it magnetic is that we are imperfect and that he loves us and he takes us and he cleans us up. That we're not where we need to be. Oh, heavens, no, we're not. But praise Jesus, we are not where we were. We have come a long way. Yeah, you can clap for that. Jesus has done good in our lives. Yes. But it's not our perfection that makes people want a piece of Jesus. It is the fact that we're flawed. But they can see that we're less flawed than we were. And then they go, what are you doing? Something's different about you. Yeah, that's magnetic. And God, God knows this about us. This is amazing. He already knows this, right? Psalm 103, verses 13 through 18. I love this passage. It says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Get this. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower in the field. The wind blows it over and it's gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear Him and His righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep His covenant and remember to obey His precepts. I love that. The grace of Jesus isn't magnetic because of our perfection, but our imperfection. He's not excusing sin in our life. He's not. That's not the point. Don't walk out of and saying, well, Joel just said it's okay just to live a life of sin. No, the Bible covers that too. God forbid. But it's saying that we, don't, we have to stop acting like we're perfect. I've said this a thousand times. The world doesn't care that we make mistakes. They care that we lie about it and act like we don't. Because they know that's not real. But what makes Jesus magnetic to people in our lives is the fact that we're imperfect. So part of the solution for getting past all this is something that actually late 19th century, early 20th century theologian J.C. Ryle said. He said, the cure for self-righteousness is self-knowledge. Think about that. 
The cure for self-righteousness is self-knowledge. In other words, when I actually know what I am, and I'm honest about that, and I recognize that I'm not perfect, and I've got sin that I entertain far too much in my own life, there's not room for self-righteousness anymore. <laughs> I, can't, I can't pretend that I'm, I'm perfect anymore because I'm like, oh, man, Lord, you, I still need your help on this thing. I'm still getting way, who I'm still struggling with this same sin. I'm, it's, still, it's still kicking me. <sighs> I got no place to be. I have no room to be self-righteous now. I love that quote. I love that quote. The cure for self-righteousness is self-knowledge. Because the, the grace of Jesus isn't magnetic because of our perfection but our imperfection. So instead of living in the darkness of faking it to the point of being exhausted, because it's, it's hard to live a double life. That's tough. It's tough to live like a Christian on Sunday and come up on Monday, live like the devil, but then someone from your Sunday world steps into that Monday world and suddenly you're like, oh, oh, now what do I do? I got to act like the devil because they don't know I'm a Christian, but that person thinks I, that's exhausting. Stop. Instead, step into the light. Step into the light of what His grace is. Step into the light. Yes, it's painful. Just like when you turn the lights on in the middle of the night and it's painful. But it's worth it. Because we, we, we awaken to what He really wants to do in us. That He's not expecting perfection out of us. Even if He was, that would be His job to do in us. Because we can't. He knows how we're formed. He knows we're dust. He knows that we are sinners saved by grace. Yes, saved by grace, but sinners, yes. He knows that. So the first thing we have to do is we have to repent of the attitudes of the Pharisees and the biblical attorneys. We have to repent of that. We have to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've settled for faking it, just looking apart, that I've, I know a whole lot of stuff, but I'm not willing to do much of it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. Repentance is not just even saying I'm sorry. Repentance is like going one direction and then making a 180 and going the other way. So it's not just I'm sorry. It's the rest of the equation. It's turning around and doing something different. The whole series has been about doing something different. Our whole Global Focus Month is about making sure that we see our calling to the nations, but to also see our calling to the nations next door, to do something different, to be different, not just to rearrange a few little you know, behavioral aspects and some maybe part our hair on a different side, no, 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 but to actually be different, to repent of those attitudes. Last year, a great quote that I was given from a professor of mine. He said this. He said, as disciples of Jesus, don't model perfection. Model redemption. Model redemption. I mean, that means when you're in front of your friends, don't model perfection. Model redemption. You are redeemed. Yeah. Not perfect, but you are redeemed. When you're in front of your, your, your family, don't model perfection. <laughs> if I ever thought I was perfect, ask my wife. <laughs> She's going to tell you real quick. Yours truly is not perfect, but I can model redemption. Amen. I can model the fact that when I make a mistake, I go back and say, that was really dumb. I'm sorry. That's redemption. Perfection goes, I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> you want to have marital trouble real quick, guys? Never apologize. Don't say I didn't warn you. Don't, do not say I didn't warn you, but model redemption, not perfection. When you're in front of your, you know, when you're, you're in front of your, your friends at school, you're in front of your, your co-workers, don't model perfection, model redemption. You make a mistake, own it. I'm sorry. I messed up. I'm sorry. I'm going to do better. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to model redemption because Jesus has called us to be better. He's called us to do more, but he's called us to model redemption. Perfection, we're never going to hit. Not this side of heaven, but redemption now, no, you and I got a shot at that one. See, the danger of what the Pharisees and the experts in the law did is they kept themselves and other people from the good news of Jesus because they made it so burdensome that nobody could have ever gotten it. They themselves couldn't do it. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. It's not about what you can do. Jesus is saying, it is what I did. It's what I'm going to do through you. And then as he works that out through us, his grace becomes magnetic, not because of perfection in us, but because of that imperfection, that we're not wholly, well, completely yet. That, we're not, that, that, you know, we're still in the oven, and the master chef has not done bacon yet. We're still in, we're still in process. And we're just about ready to, to receive communion together. Part of what communion does is reminds us of what He has done and what He has done through us 
so that we don't have to fake it anymore. 